Welcome to episode 277 of School Librarians United. I am your host, Amy Herman. This podcast is dedicated to the issues and challenges school librarians face every day. As a school librarian, just having finished my 17th year, I knew I wanted a podcast which addressed the nuts and bolts of running a successful library program. I don't claim to have the answers, but I hope that this is a platform to share resources and exchange ideas. Now is a perfect time to mention that all the ideas and opinions expressed in this podcast by myself, my interview guests, and listeners who reach out to the podcast are our own and do not reflect those of our school districts. When incorporating research, I always make sure to cite my sources. So whether you are a novice or a veteran school librarian, this podcast has something for you. Amanda Jones's upcoming book, That Librarian, will be available starting on August 27th, but you can pre-order your copy now. And if you use the indie bookseller Cavalier House Books in Amanda's hometown of Dunham Springs, Louisiana, you will get a signed copy. I've included a link in the show notes. When you look at the cover of Amanda's book, you might recognize the Freedom Fighter shirt that she's wearing. She reached out to the designer, Christy, who then designed a line of That Librarian apparel as well as That Librarian flair, such as a bag, sticker, and mug. I love that we can all be That Librarian, who advocates for our students and their access to our library books every day. You'll find a link to this online store in our show notes. Please know that 15% of the proceeds go to the Texas Library Association, as that is the home state of the designer. I welcome you and all listeners to reach out with your feedback and episode suggestions. You can reach me either on Facebook, on X, formerly known as Twitter. My handle is at LMS underscore United. On threads, you can find me at School Librarians United and on Blue Sky at SLU Podcast or the email address schoollibrariansunited at gmail.com. If you include your mailing address, I'll be sure to send you a podcast sticker. And now a word from our sponsor, Capstone. Capstone is an innovative publisher and education technology provider of children's content for school libraries, classrooms, and at-home learning. Home of the award-winning PebbleGo Research Database, Capstone has a passion for creating inspired learning and intellectual curiosity in children, and I'm so excited to be working with them. I'm also grateful to Capstone for their continued commitment to support the podcast in Season 6. They are offering listeners of School Librarians United a very special discount. Visit shop.capstonepop.com and use the code UNITED to get $20 off an order of $100 or more for both print and Capstone interactive ebooks. That's code UNITED for $20 off an order of $100 or more for both print and ebooks on shop.capstonepop.com. And now for today's episode, Library Instigator, and my conversation with Robin Thompson. Robin Thompson, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. So excited. Friends, I, I am, I've, I've, we had a quick conversation, you know, you and I, in the hallway at GLMA Summer Institute. Yes. And I, I am just so grateful that that you have agreed to be on the show. I had such a blast at GLMA Summer Institute. And uh, Lauren Mobley was very instrumental in, in me coming and, and keynoting. But I had an opportunity to mix and mingle with all of the library leaders down there, including you. So I, I'm so grateful. But let me ask, uh, you're going to be more involved with GLMA Summer Institute next year, aren't you? Yes. So... Um- I'm in the southeast part of Georgia, and the bulk of our librarians that are members of GLMA and that are really involved are more the Atlanta area, the northeast and west area, uh, and I've always wanted to get more involved. So last year, I um, already kind of was friends with a lot of them. I said, stop just telling me, email me, whatever, and I was like, put me in charge of something. So I helped um, read through all the sessions and help pick the sessions. We had more than we've ever had before. Um, we were able to add some time we uh instead of 36 sessions we had we built the schedule so we could actually accommodate 49 sessions and um so the two co-chairs this year one was new one had been doing it for five years so jen cole is said i'm time you know five years i need a break and so i will be working with lauren mobley next year mobley in the mix um as the co-chairs and we're still not sure if we're going to go back to peach street city or if we're going to look for a new location but I'm super excited. Well, I I've, I got to tell you, I got to see a little behind the scenes. I arrived before the conference officially started, and then I got to see all of you work your magic. And I got to tell you, I just felt like such a, a sort of a cheat. I walked in, and everybody had done all the work, 
and this amazing conference went off without a hitch. But, but what a, a fantastic opportunity. More than a few listeners tuning in have been or will be a part of their state leadership and might be a part of planning uh, their, their next conference. I'd love to hear how GLMA came to have their annual state conference in the first few weeks of your summer vacation, because I'm far more familiar with librarian conferences being either scheduled in the fall after the school year has started or in the spring before the school year ends. Yeah, so I had to kind of ask everybody about this because as long as I've been involved, it's always been in the summer. And so from what I've kind of gathered, we have a state conference in November, Georgia um, Ed Tech Conference. A lot of people go to FETC in January, which is down in Florida. And so I think they've always tried to do it that very first weekend that school's out because it's kind of like you've got a lot of ideas. Let's kind of come together, even though you're kind of tired, but it's a way just to kind of brainstorm everything you've done that year and kind of recharge, like at least give us something to think about over the summer. Okay, so here's some great things. What can I go ahead and use? Instead of having to go back to school and try to fit it all in, we have the summer to kind of work on those ideas that we learned. Well, and more importantly, you you are more likely to get people attending because they don't have to ask for time off. Yes. And so there's only maybe one or two schools in Georgia that are still in session, or if they are in session, it's like teacher work days, post-planning. But most of those, most everybody was already out at that point. We have talked about possibly moving it to February. We wonder, we feel like we haven't reached the 200 mark to get people there. Like we're, we've been like 181. One year, I think we have 189. And we we're like, how do we get a 200 people coming? And we, so we've toyed with maybe moving it to February. There's nothing that would interfere, but it's kind of hard to plan for February right now because that's only like so many months. And so it's one of those that we're going to think about for 2026, but I don't know for sure. But we may just keep it June. We'll see. I, I was going to say, uh, it was a fantastic yeah, turnout. And and again, if you don't have to ask permission to attend, yeah. you don't have to take any of those those days off of work, all of a sudden you really don't have as much of an excuse to to be able to, to have to justify. And there's always worth sending out a survey. But, you know, I, I think we all can agree that when you try and please everyone, you it doesn't are happen. going. That, no, it doesn't work. And we, and we do try to we try to do Peachtree City. It's central in Georgia. Um, you know, it's right outside of Atlanta. It's not as expensive as Atlanta. So it's a little bit cheaper. Uh, but then we did Helen last year, which is up in the mountains. We've done Savannah, which is close to me. Um, so we try to, you know, every other year go to kind of a destination. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it works. It absolutely so. does. So, you know, let's let's start off with this. Let's introduce yourself, please. Tell us about yeah. your library, the grades you serve, and some of the programs that you offer. Absolutely. I am Robin Thompson, McAllister Elementary down in Bryan County, Georgia. It is a suburb of Savannah, which is Chatham County. We did live in Savannah for quite some time, about 25 years, and I made the commute because I was teaching at the high school. And we'll talk about that in a minute, I think. But I made the switch four years ago. To an elementary, I serve pre-K uh, through fifth grade. And when I moved into the space, it was a fairly new building. It had been old, about five years old. And I decided we needed to reinvent the library. It was beautiful. It was very pristine and new. But it just didn't have like a lot of, it didn't have a theme. It didn't have a life. It didn't have a name. And so we created Camp Read Some More. Because the more you read, the more you know. And the kids will always say that. And so I try to make it a flexible schedule. Our kindergarten and first grade teachers, they like that day of the week, every week. And so I do just the library. We still have a tech coordinator, our, our tech resource teacher that works with my technology, but she and I do tons together. And I work with our curriculum instructor um, as well. But um, I do not have to necessarily be in charge of the technology. I do pretty much just run the library. Sounds like a dream job. I, I got to tell you, friends, when I when I was lucky to go and speak with all these amazing school librarians in Georgia, one of the first things I was very candid about is if I had to do it all over again, I would pick myself up and move to Georgia and start my, my school librarian career there where they were growing. It is a part of the United States, which is growing exponentially. Now, in fairness, the Rust Belt, and I'm part of that in Detroit, it is it is making something of a comeback. Uh, we are sort of the ugly stepsister between New York and Chicago and uh, far, far less expensive. 
but it doesn't see the growth that that Georgia is. And so, friends, if any of you are just tuning in and you're you're graduating with your uh, teaching or your library degree, and you're looking for a place to call home, my gosh, you could not ask for a more hospitable Come group of, of librarians than the, <laughs> than the Georgia uh, School Librarians. We'll give you a peach basket full of peach <laughs> Dude, goodies. Dude, I, I gotta tell you, hospitality, they did not lie and did not disappoint. It's what we do, it's what we do. <laughs> so, you know, I have to ask you, um, you've shared your schedule on your website. I love that you have such a balance because I can see on average, now it's not always, but on average, you teach four 30-minute classes a day, but then the rest of your day is unscheduled. So the, I think the schedule that's up right now is kind of towards the end of the school year um, where things we were starting to wrap up. Um, so I changed the month, the days, um, the weeks underneath. It's a Google Sheet. It's a spreadsheet in Google. And so I just add our weeks at the bottom um, so that they know if we have a holiday coming up, if it's picture day, all that stuff. For the most part, my kindergarten and first grade teachers in pre-K, they just want to know we're coming this day, we've got a story, you know, that thing. And so we usually have things planned for them. As far as second, third, fourth, fifth, I try to get them to come weekly because I think sometimes kids, if they are not told, if their teacher doesn't schedule a time, they won't come back or they, we tend to lose books. Like they end up in their desk or the whole thing. So I try to get them to come, even if they don't come once a week, come every other week. I do plan things specifically for those grades. And I will tell the teacher, hey, I need y'all this week. Go ahead and put it in your schedule that I'm going to need you. You know, look and see. Book tastings for third, fourth, and fifth because we finally genrefied. And that didn't really mean much to them unless I explained it and walked them through the genre. So that usually happens in the fall. If I know they're doing units on certain things, I'm trying to make sure we match up with their curriculum. But for the most part, the kindergarten and first grade like to have their set days. The others can kind of fill in as needed or when I highly suggest that they come. I'm, I've got to imagine a strongly worded email from librarian Miss Thompson. I just... Hey, I need you here. It so, amuses me. So having met you... you're a 20-year veteran high school teacher. For listeners contemplating a similar transition, what helped you make such a drastic change in the ages of the students you support? Because I made that change, but for me, I had actually sort of taken a break. I'd had three babies. I went to library school. And so being a high school teacher seems almost like a previous life to me. Like that, yeah, that, that was, that was my (laughs) twenties. I really, I mean, when I was going through school, I always loved English. I always loved books. I loved reading. I didn't really think about librarian. I really was just classroom, high school English teacher. That's what I'm going to do. Very fortunate. I've been in this community since my husband and I got married in 97. I started teaching at Richmond Hill High School in the same county um, in 97. I was English in the classroom, like 10th grade, mostly 10th, some 9th, some 11th, in a writer's workshop class until, I guess it was like 16 or 18, 17 years, I think. It all runs together. And I finally was like, I really did want to get a master's, but what do I want to do it in? And I, I mean, I do. I love the library. I've always been the library kid. You know, during the summer, I had the bag that was just like loaded down. And even as a teenager, I mean, my mom's like, I'm not buying a lot of books. Like, we're going to go to the library and get the books. And so I was like, that's fine. But you know, I like to own some books. And anyways, Georgia Southern University is about an hour away in Statesburg. So I got my master's. And here it's called instructional technology and you can do the tech side or the media specialist side so I did the media specialist side we had a position we had a media specialist at our high school that moved so I took over but mostly when I finally took that position we already had one media specialist I did mostly the tech side like more integrating technology I redesigned a middle school media center because we took over a middle school behind our high school and I redesigned their middle school into we called it the link we are linked education with technology, and I got to do a complete redo. It was kind of cool, but long story short, I'd been at the same high school for like 22 years, and it just got to be where I did everything. Like, you know, if they said, what's your job? And I'm like, well, you know, and it just, I was finally at the point where I was kind of getting burned out, and I just said, I could stay there. I mean, I've got another, I mean, I'm not like one of those, I don't even know how many years I have left to retirement. I just don't even count because I don't like think about it. And I also just love what I do. I can't sit still. So like I'm at home all day, I'm going to like go crazy. So I just thought, 
if I'm going to change, now's the time I need to do something. And this elementary position came open and one of my friends works at the school. She said, you need to apply for this. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I was like, <laughs> I'm six feet tall. Like I'm a big girl, you know, I'm tall. And I'm like, I don't know, like a lot of, like, I like my own children, but like a lot of little, little kids. I was like, I don't know about this. Like, I really was like this hilarious thing. They're all like, Robin, are you serious? I'm like, yeah. Like, it's like the Toy Story <laughs> aliens. Like, Ooh. you know, I feel like they were just going to be at my, like at my feet, just like, I don't know. So I was a little nervous, but my husband, I was like, I don't know if I can do elementary. And he said, honey, let me tell you. He said, you have the attention span and the mentality of a five-year-old. He said, you are going to be great. He said, you are like Buddy the Elf, but like in a female body, like you are a kid. I never, like anybody asks me my age, I'm always like, when I tell them, they're like, there's no way. Like you act like you're five. I'm like, yeah, I do. Like, or a fourth grade boy, because I really have like the potty humor sometimes. So anyway, so. I made the switch and I loved it. I mean, just sometimes you know when it's ready, like when it's time. Like some people, and I built a really cool place there. I mean, I had, I mean, we loved our space, but um, things change. And I just, I needed a change. My own kids were about to be at the high school. I was like, you know, now it's just, it just felt right. And I was just ready for something new, something fresh. I, I think that's helpful to hear because there are people for whom there is this, Concern. Why would I leave something when I've got everything the way I've worked so hard to get it? Everything is the way I want it. Yes. And and yes. I, I'll be honest, you know, as somebody who taught uh, elementary for 14 years, I could plan out a month's worth of lessons yeah. in one day. And I was done. And it was like, wow. I mean, I I I can do this. It just, um, I don't know. Like, I just think I got tired of like, I don't know. Like, duties got added. Not that I've because I've been there so long, oh, Robin knows how to do that. Or she'll know where that is because she's been here forever. She's like the dinosaur at the high school. Even though, I mean, I'm still fairly young. I just started there when I was 24 years old. It just sometimes you need to, like, I don't know. I just was like, I need a new challenge. Like, I just, you know, not midlife crisis, but I guess like job life, like a midlife job crisis, whatever. Well, and I think it's important because when you realize it does take work to leave. Yeah. Like it, uh, you are, it, yes. there is a, yes. when you leave, you're leaving something that's comfortable, familiar, and, and you feel very capable. And I think the one thing that I knew I was going to struggle with was that, that time during which you really don't feel capable. And, and that to me was, was hard because I was starting a new job. Yeah. And the, I missed that. I want to feel capable. Well, mine was getting used to a new faculty and them accepting me. I'm fine. I mean, I'm not one that worries about what other people think. I like, I'm just like, be, it, please, my target is not on my back. If you got something to say, my target's right here. I am, I'm not, I try not to be intimidating. Like, I think maybe my size, I, I'm not, I make myself self sound like an Amazon, but I think people are also because I'm just kind of like spastic and so you know, I'm just kind of um I think the word is frenetic <laughs> Frene you yeah. are, it's more, and more they just are frenetic like, how do I approach her and I'm like you just do you just come in my office and you interrupt me you have to interrupt my brain but um, are you always hyped up on caffeine or is no, this just no, your natural this is not caffeine this, this is not like, there's I, no caffeine no, not really okay. I mean I usually okay. have like I drink I like cold coffee more than hot coffee because I'm just I don't know naturally and because we're in Savannah it's hot or this area yeah so um have like one cold iced coffee in the morning but that like I will say I always say this like I usually forget where I put it so I never finish it. it ends up being like in the closet or it's in the laundry I don't know it's just it's it is ADHD it I finally got diagnosed so yeah it just okay so I'm just gonna be honest um well the word that came to mind it wasn't so much frenetic as effervescent you, keep you, saying you, that. you absolutely you are such a it's like when you pour champagne and the bubbles are all going. Yeah. Yeah. You're like, I can absolutely. See that. You have a very effervescent personality. I mean, there are times where I do come down, but like in the morning, I hit the ground running. Yeah. And like yeah. And when I do things like this, when I'm doing stuff I love, yeah. I have, I get fast brain. Like that's what um, I have fast a niece. Fast brain? Fast brain. I love that term. So I have a niece. I have a niece who has ADHD as well. And I, the doctors explained it. She was like, this uh, Aunt Robin. And I was like, yeah. She's like, you know what? I finally realized you and I both have. And I was like, she said, fast brains. And I was like, what? And that's such a, that's the perfect description. 
Like her doctors, like she doesn't understand attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. She understands that her brain is constantly faster than our mouths can filter. You know, like it, like it, we just are always our brain is working overtime and thinking about just constant stimulation. I want to spend some time, if you don't mind, please, Robin. Uh, your self-proclaimed title that you've given yourself is library instigator. And that's part of your bio on social media. I'm hoping you'll elaborate on this as I think listeners would have a better appreciation for you as a leader in our profession. Yeah. So to instigate, like sometimes it gets like a negative, like when you hear like, well, he instigated this, it kind of has a negative connotation. But to instigate is to sort of bring about change, to try to, you know, push something on somebody, but also just encourage people to to accept something and so or to do something. And so like those third and fourth, fifth grade teachers that don't always want to come, I am instigating them to come. And I want to show you what we do besides just check in and check out. And so I just, I think about all the hats that librarians wear and just trying to make our not just our staff and our kids, but also the the community and the other people in education understand, you know, what we do. And I don't know, I just kind of like to think about, I mean, can maybe stirring up trouble? I mean, sometimes you think of an instigator as like somebody who stirs up trouble. And I'm probably not the biggest stirrer of the pot when it comes to librarians. I mean, the heck, look at me into Jones. <laughs> I mean, not that she, I mean, she probably did intentionally, but you know, we have to advocate. We can't just sit back anymore. Like we have to speak up for ourselves. We have to defend our clients. We have our, like our students and everybody that we represent. We have to love out loud. I mean, that's what I feel like my shirt always says. And so uh, I think that's part of it. It's just, I mean, it kind of gets a bad kind of, bad rap but in a way maybe librarians need to have that right now because we kind of get stuck in that mold well and you know i've never met a third grade teacher who is worried about having a job the next year because of budget cuts no offense but the third grade teacher is going to be teaching maybe not third grade maybe it's going to be fourth grade maybe it's there's going to be a job for you unfortunately and this has happened so much especially in the state of michigan it's just easier to take me out and replace me with somebody who's making fourteen fifty an hour. And that is a solution which, unfortunately, and especially right now, as the COVID ESSER funds have all ceased, now districts, where they had this sort of grace to keep on positions, now are making some difficult decisions. And they're not getting rid of, you know, seventh grade math. They're not getting rid of 10th grade ELA. They're getting rid of the librarians. And you can't get rid of the lunchroom cap manager because somebody's got to make the food. But we, they, if we don't show them what we do besides shelve and check in and check out, then we are at a loss for our job. So we do have to kind of instigate, you know, and and um, for ourselves. I mean, we've got to stir up business sometimes. I mean, I feel like, you know, I'm doing a dog and pony show, you know, like come to can't read some more, you know, just to kind of get anybody because I'm like, I don't want them to forget that we are the heart and that. I mean, I am valuable, not just me, but we all in our profession are immensely valuable. So let's instigate some library trouble. Well, sure. So I- I'm glad you you brought up, uh, you named your library and 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 people that there's a whole idea of, of branding, not just ourselves, but branding our spaces, because in there and we can sort of create a theme that that drives not just your programming, but you and the role that you serve in it. But you are, you know, you've got this camp read some more. I, I'd like to know, I've done a little bit of cyber stalking. You shared a little about this in your presentation that you gave in the Summer Institute. But would you give us a, an, a better idea of how this, this theme of camp read some more has become pervasive across uh, your entire program? Well, yeah, I just feel like if you, I mean, in order for it to have value. I want the kids to be like, I want to have a name. I want it to feel like a place that they talk about. And even the families, like when they come for open house, they're like, I have never seen a library like this. And I'm like, and that's why I'm going to be here for a little while longer, you know, because I just want them to feel like it's integral. Like it's, we have to have it here. So I've always been super outdoorsy. I grew up closer to the mountains than I did the beach. So we were always, you know, two hours heading to the mountains. I love hiking. I just love being outside. 
And I did not come up with the name Camp Reedsmore. I just, I literally think I was like Googling when I knew I was going to be at the elementary and I kind of had this blank space. I was like, elementary library themes or something. And I saw a font that was made out of like logs and it's, and this lady had used it. I think it, some places switch their theme every year. And I'm like, no, we're going all in and this is going to be our space. And like, this is it. I probably did have to get it off teachers, pay teachers, sorry. But after that, I was like, okay, so we've got the name and I'm a little crafty. I mean, I'm not hugely crafty, but like I'm, I'm pretty decent with like power tools. So I found these really easy to build tents. I did actually presented at FETC 2022 about creating Camp Read Some More. And we built a mini tent. I took my husband's power tools. I, I mean, if I can do it, anybody can do it. I promise it's safe. And so we built these tents and the kids just, I mean, they were super easy. We have rugs inside of them. I just wanted it to have like a feeling. Like when the kids walked in, like the little coziness of a tent, we have a campfire that we kind of built with these electric we call it magic fire. So when they each the kids get to cut it on, you know, we take turns and it won't burn you. And we have all the people have just given us all these plush, like the, you know, stuffies, like animal stuffies. Like we've got all these campfire critters. I got donated old Christmas trees and the kids they're like, why you got Christmas trees? I said, no, these are just trees from the, from the woods, you know, but they do have lights if I want them. On. We adopted Mama Squirrel at David Ezra Stein's book, uh, Old Mama Squirrel. She's our mascot. I don't know. We just, yeah, I branded it. And then on Canva, and I love, I use Adobe sometimes, I use Canva, but Canva, I finally found like a template that had a tent, a tree, like how all this stuff. And I use it for everything. It's all of my signage, the colors, the fonts, everything. I tweak it, but it all is the same brand. And so I just feel like that's made the kids... They, I mean, like if, if it was, if I was to leave and they were to take that space away, there would be protests. Well, and your web design, forgive me, this also extends to your digital presence. Oh, yeah, your digital yeah. presence also is an I extension of this brand. This, yeah. And, and it's, it's the same. I mean, we all have to be cognizant of our, of our library space online. And I don't think people look at it enough, but I really wanted it to be like, and during the summer, I tell our parents, like, please go here. I've got online resources, but like, I just knew what I wanted. I mean, I don't have an awesome graphic design background, but like I knew in my mind, like I just had this vision. And so the um, logs, you know, the the wedge, wood wedges or whatever in the in the categories. And but yeah, the colors The I mean, orange is my favorite color, but I love green and yellow, bright, sunny colors. And mm -hmm. I don't know, it just kind of all worked. So I, I want to ask you, because this is where I, I became absolutely obsessed with watching videos of you during hashtag car line shenanigans <laughs> I, it's i even had to make sure i spelled shenanigans correctly it's shenanigans I, yes. I know i'm telling car you line. Yeah. what am i yeah. i was i was talking to somebody and they're like car line what's car line i'm like oh friend elementary school oh. car line yes so just for for those who might not know what car line shenanigans car line. so what does car line mean in your school okay so high school we the library is open before and after school during lunch. So we really didn't have a lot of duties like um, because we just are always open. Um, elementary, you and my, I have a pair pro. Um, we are assigned things all the time. Like we have a lunch time. So she gets one, I get one. And so we cover each other in the library for that. Um, and they call them connections at our school, which it does. At first I was like, <laughs> what the heck is that? Because I'm like, <laughs> oh, they've been like electives. And I'm like, no, no, it's where we connect with our students and parents. Connections. And, um, it's other duties as assigned. Other, uh, duties, other duties as assigned. Other yes. duties as assigned. But <laughs> so like the very first day I got there, um, <laughs> we have two we have two PE coaches and like so there's there's two spots that are like truly outdoors. Like you're not anywhere near kind of the building. You're further out. Like one and one is where I am, and the other one was like another directing traffic. Anyway, uh, one of the guy coaches said, "Hey." Why are we the two that always get stuck with outside do with those those two do connections or whatever? I was like, well, what what are they? I mean, I was like, I, I first of all I like when people complain. I mean, I know we have to sometimes, but I was like, what is this that you're complaining about? He's like, oh well, you stand there and you you know we have it's kind of hard to explain. We have our school's fairly large, and so we have two different um, car lines, some in the front and some in the back, depending on their grade, and they come to an intersection, and I have to direct the traffic, let make sure everybody gets turned in and turned out. So. I said, well, so I'm outside like for 30 minutes. And he was like, yeah. And, well, first of all, I hate when people say, yeah. I'm like, yes. And then he's like, 
you know it rains. I was like, oh, I love rain. <laughs> he was like, you know it's hot. I was like, well, I mean, it's hot no matter where I am. Like, if you're doing a connection outside, it's going to be hot. And he's like, well, you have to wave or you have to like direct traffic or something. I was like, but can I enjoy it? I mean, like, I mean, is there anything that says I can't not enjoy it? Because <laughs> I mean, like, he was just like, Bleh. I'm like, no wonder, like, everybody's mad when they get to school because you're directing traffic, dude. And so, um, I, yeah, so I just started, I like got out there and like I was holding signs. At first, I didn't even have like a stop sign or anything. I was like, what am I supposed to do? And so I was just using my hands. But then I realized my hands are always going, like when I talk, whenever. And so people had no idea if I was telling them to stop or go or anything. So quickly, I had to realize I needed a stop sign and like a wand. But um, I don't know. It just kind of started with, first of all, just being super pumped because these kids are coming to school. And I'm like, good morning. And I'm like, so good to see you. And they were just like, who is the lady in the car? Like, what, who is that lady out there? And um, I'm, I'm the first face that these kids, the ones that are coming in one direction that they see. And I'm like, there's kindergarten kids, pre-K kids who are like, I don't want to go to school. You know, they're like freaking out in the back of the car. And I'm like, what's up? So good to see you. We're so glad you're here. And all of a sudden they're like, oh my gosh, we get to see the crazy lady today. And they're like, their mom's like, yes, crazy Miss T. She's out there. That's my, that's what ended up being my social media thing. You also, first of all, let's be, let's be oh, clear. Costumes. Okay. Let's talk about the costumes for one minute <laughs> because you don't just walk out in your plain clothes librarian. No, bar. no. You are um, decked. I'm in costume. Yeah. Yes. Well, so I will be honest, like it's not every single day, but it has started where, so I think the first one was like a few headbands. Like on a Friday, I had like dilly bop, you know, like something on my head. And one time I had like a hula skirt or whatever. And then October came and I'm a huge Halloween fan. Love me some Halloween. And so, I don't know, I just, um, I had already a few costumes because we ha like have a lot of Halloween costumes. And then it just kind of snowballed. They're like, what is she going to be today? So October, I pretty much have something every single day. And then Christmas came. They said, oh, well, October's over. What are you going to do now? I'm like, oh, game on. I got some Thanksgiving costumes. <laughs> you know, this dad was like, oh, you want me more costumes? I'm like, oh, yeah, I do. Do people donate them to you? I have to ask. I do. I have. I, I wish more did. Um, okay. Uh, yes, they do. And then I have had a few. I have like, I had a kid who was the Kool-Aid. It was like, looks like the red Kool-Aid man, you know? He yeah, donated yeah, yeah. that. He's like, I think you would love this. I'm like, sure. So I have that. Somebody gave me. You're, oh. the, you're the human construction cone. Oh, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That's the that video. One. Yeah. Uh, so I saw somebody else. Somebody said, oh, Robin, you've got to get this costume. And Target's the one that had the best one. I mean hysterical like it's my and then I have a traffic light anything that's traffic related I've bought and uh I mean I don't know I just love it because it's like I have a oh and I have dogs so um I have a fanny pack with my phone and like a playlist and then I have dog treats so uh I need to take more pictures of my dogs but I have probably 25 or 30 dogs that come through Carline so hashtag dogs of Carline they know to get a treat if I don't have one they're super upset if I'm out but that day you know the dogs names too that's the best oh, part yeah. Like, oh yeah friends we've got video is. yeah we've got video <laughs> of and I was just I was sitting there just watching video after video of, the dogs. of Robin yeah. and and doing Carline shenanigans and we say and love you talking mean it. to the we dogs. always say love you mean yeah. it love you mean it love you mean it oh my god it was it was such a delight yeah. So anyway, I just, I don't know. And then people are like, are you videoing any of this? And I was like, no. And then I started videoing it. And then they're like, well, you need to put this up there. And I don't know. Sometimes they get a little long winded and like, so I don't know. I'm not like a blue check thing. And um, so like on Instagram, it's if it's over a minute, it won't let me post it. I'm like, I don't have time. Sometimes I'm like, I don't have time for all this. But like, I mean, I just love what I do. I just love oh, what I do. You're hilarious. And people are taking video of you. Like I've seen the video that I've seen are people who have taken video of you and see I don't know what I look like I never know because like I don't there, I don't have a mirror big enough to see my whole body before I leave so when I it, when, until I see somebody else's video or picture I'm like you're oh a walking God. piece of sunshine and friends you've got to see the sun costume that you wear it's just that I wear that when it's cloudy too I wore that the last day of school but anytime it looks like it's gonna rain or if it's kind of a gray dreary day I'll put that sunshine on I'm gonna give you a little piece of sunshine this but morning I, I just to me honestly because you're right especially with our littles some of them mm -hmm. it, it is way early some of them are do mm -hmm. not oh, yeah. wake up on the right yeah they don't wake up on the, yeah what 
Are you yeah. joking? We start, I, I'm out there. I'm out there from seven and five to seven thirty-five. Holy! It's sh- early. Okay. And when it's dark, of course. Sometimes, like when the time of changed, course. I have those shoes. My favorite thing are shoes. Uh, I don't know if you saw. I did. Any of these, I did. But I have these. Your um, shoes lit up. Silver high tops that that yes that light up. It has seventeen modes. It's the best thirty six dollars I ever spent. I love those shoes. So forgive me. Seventeen different colors. Your school begins. And so first bell is at, at eight seven thirty. Seven forty. We 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 start announcements at seven forty. We that's the we don't really have bells. Um, like we no we just kind of say, um, good morning at seven forty. Let's stand for the pledge. It's a very early start to your day. Oh come on, I love it. I, and I, I, I yes, but we're adults. The the children. <laughs> it's a very different thing for the children. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, hard. It's a, and and but but the parents. I'll be honest. Like I get a lot of feedback from parents because they're like, like I don't want to go to work today. You know, or like we have a lot, we live in a very large military community and these soldiers, you know, they're coming through, they're either deployed or they've just come home. And I have moms, if, you know, say a dad is deployed or a husband's deployed, that they will FaceTime, like wherever it is, going through car line so that they can get to see Aww. me in the morning. That's so amazing. I know. are tackling something that so many people feel has been imposed on them. Other duties as assigned usually strikes fear in the hearts of educators everywhere. For me, it was lunch duty and French toast day because my other duties as assigned, I'm sorry, no costume in the world is going to make syrup less sticky. Cleaning up after those, uh, after those littles who managed to get syrup everywhere. I want to also ask you a great deal about your next passion, and that is you are a chicken mama. You shared this with us, and, and I saw this amazing live stream of, of your baby chicks uh, hatching on YouTube. I was just transfixed. You know, how many, yes, tell us a little bit about, because you're, you don't just, you don't, they don't just hatch and you send them to some farm. No, gosh, no. And I think it was funny because, like, you are not easy to make speechless. And when you were like, so what are your plans for the rest of the summer, Robin? I'm like, oh, hang out with my chickens. And you were like, <laughs> you didn't know what to say. I was like, I made a speech. You, you really did. Congratulations. <laughs> Kudos to you. Tell us about being a chicken mama. So I grew up in South Carolina and way out in the country. We had chickens just growing up. I mean, free range, nothing special. You know, just we'd get some chicken. My dad's like, hey, want a tractor supply? You know, we need tractor supply back then, feed and seed. And so we would have them, whatever. So when I moved to the school, um, the uh, a, a mom before me, uh, a couple of moms said, we want to build a coop. Like they wanted just to do sort of this agricultural concept. They had right, we've got raised beds for um, our STEM teacher uh, does, raises vegetables. And like right now we've got tomatoes and eggplants and kind of a community garden. And then um, they wanted to put in a chicken coop and it's a fabulous chicken coop. I mean, it's really well built. And the teacher, the two teachers that had been in charge of it before I got there, one was getting moved, transfer, uh, husband military moving away. And one was moving to a different school. So they're like, Who's going to take over the chickens? And I'm like, oh, <laughs> I love chickens. <laughs> and they're like, seriously? They're like, I mean, how lucky are we that you love Carlisle and you love chickens? And like, and you're going to be our librarian? I'm like, yeah. So um, I promise I don't have any extra hours in the day that anybody else does. But um, so we so we th- we sell the eggs. So we do have a club that um, our clubs meet um, every Monday after school for grades three through five. Uh, we do need a little more mature student out there. But um, it's so that is a club that I do um, once we have clubs. It's only about 12 weeks that we do them. And so the kids learn about chickens, but we also like it's kind of a um, like a recycling club. Like we just do a lot of um, earthy things. And but we also take care of the chickens. And uh, but I check on them every day. Um, a lot of our kindergarten kids, when they start studying farm week or li- second grade studied life cycle, I just take them out there and we just bring them out and we talk to them and we play with them and they feed them and it's right where they go out for recess. So they also can walk by every day. And I'm always like, yes, throw some grass in there. Like, you know, whatever, if you want to, if you've got food and you want your class wants to come out there, like scraps, like vegetables, like lettuce, tomatoes, whatever, I'll open the door, throw them in there. Y'all can play with, talk to them, whatever. So this year we started, so those chickens are getting a little older. Chickens usually live about six to eight years. They don't have a really long life expectancy. So some of these chickens are getting to be senior citizens. And um, I don't, think we'll probably have a lot that live through the summer because the heat's tough on them 
And so in the spring, I said, what if we did an incubator? What if we got new chicks, or like new hens, you know, or chickens for the coop? So I found a lady that had 12 fertilized eggs because we have no roosters because our coop is right beside classrooms. We cannot have fourth grade teachers <laughs> listening to crowing all day. They don't just crow in the morning. They crow all day. <laughs> so, so, so you see, so there are no. No, no roosters. Roosters. So our eggs, our because, eggs. Are, because of because of zoning, I mean, are you allowed to have because no, we no, can't so have them. We could have roosters. Okay, you could, we could, you could, but could. yes, but they are noisy, they're aggressive. Um, it's they're not as easy to like let the kids be around. We just it's that's a whole other gamut of farming. Like, and so our eggs, the hens will continue. Hens will lay. This is sometimes people don't understand this, but hens will continue to lay eggs. They're just eating eggs. They're not fertilized. So our hens could sit on their eggs for. 21 days and it's not going to ever hatch because it's just an eating egg. Does that make sense? Oh, perfectly. I just want to know at some point where we're going to have to like, I just was worried about, you know, us having to discuss about like, you know, when you talk about like chicken sex and, and this happening in front of the nope, children. Nope. Nope. <laughs> That's the thing. Like, so whenever we do life cycle, I always have to tell that I'm always very careful. I'm like, so we only have hens. We do not have roosters. Our eggs are just for eating. And, uh, and they often say, well, you know, do we not have chicks? I'm like, no, we don't because we don't have a rooster. And this is where you can talk about this at home. Like you can just go home and tell mom, like, they don't have roosters. Can you tell me what, what, what to say? But we're really, I mean, I kind of have a spiel that's easy and doesn't like, it's very, you know, PC or whatever. So anyway, we did the incubator this year. So we had 12 fertilized eggs. We put it in the window of the media center. And I put like, we knew the four different types that may hatch. And it is the longest 21 days. Because you're just watching and watching. And we had a little countdown. and But the kids are just like, oh, my God, I'm dying. I'm like, I'm dying, too. Like, we all want to see these eggs. And, like, day 19, like, it's usually around 19, 20, 21 days that they hatch. And day 19, there was one. We could hear it. The girl's office that's in the library, she said, and I was back in the back somewhere. She said, I hear peeping. I hear peeping. I was like, and in the egg, before it even hatched, you hear a little peeping. It was insane. And then at that point, I'm like, YouTube, yes, here we go. So we like, I'd never even live streamed on YouTube. So the kids are showing me how to do it because they are all knowledgeable. And that one started, we called her feisty because she rolled that egg. I mean, her egg is moving in the incubator and to get out. And uh, we kept it going all night. And one of our teachers happened to get up in the middle of the night to go get water or something and saw her come out of the egg. We were like, so we went back and played. I was like, oh, my God, you got us. It was like giving birth. I mean, we and it happened to be on a work day. It was so but the kids were transfixed. I had parents who were like messaging me. They're like, you have no idea. Like my kids are all sick. Like we have like big families. Like I have five kids eating breakfast on the couch, watching with no <laughs> arguing. Can we please do this every work day? <laughs> I said, oh, I can't make that happen. But it was crazy because, I mean, I think they did it a long time ago, but we were just. Well, and I wanted to and ask so you. nine out of the 12. Hatch, okay. Yeah. So nine out of the 12, which is, yeah. which is fine. You know, hashtag, hashtag nine life. Of the um, but here's a question. Some of them had yes. fuzzy feet. What, what kind of, I mean, I, I was really perplexed. This shows you, I, I don't ever go onto a farm. What's the fuzzy feet? They are called cochin, C-O-C-H-I-N, like co and then chin, like your chin. This is just a breed. I have three that are big. They're called large fowl cochin. And then I have five that are mini cochins. And they all can still be different colors. So like even, like I have two that are brown. They kind of look like chipmunks. They're called speckled. Um, I have two that are black with yellow around their neck. They're called blue lemon. And then one, I forget what color hers is called, but she's kind of a tan. She was feisty, but we call her Mabel now. I don't know. Like feisty just didn't seem like the right name after she was born. These chickens w don't come home with you in the school year. They, they are at my house right now. Yep. Mm -hmm. They are. Okay, okay. So that's what I, that, so, okay. They do they come home with you. they have to stay in a warmer. Because as long as they have like the baby fuzz, like the little downy feathers, they have to stay under a warmer. They no longer have the warmer because they're in my garage and it's like 95 degrees. They are in, I kind of have them like a, in a kennel, like my dog's old kennel. They will, so you don't know if you've got roosters or hens until they start getting older. We now know we have one rooster because the biggest um, grayish black one started crowing last week. And I was like, uh-oh. So the good thing is that the lady <laughs> I got the eggs from, I oh, said, no. I can't, and even at my house, I, know, I was like, I can't, 
I just can't have that noise. My husband's like, I love some chicken. He's gotten where he likes them, but I can't have that noise. So she will take him back because she has this huge farm. Like, and she's oh, glad. Yeah, honey, I'll take him back. I'm like, good. And then trade him for, yes, for another for batch, yes, right? Yes, <laughs> And anyway, so we are still waiting to see. I know we've got one of the small ones is a rooster, but she said he is going to probably be so quiet. You would never know. I still don't. Interesting. Yeah, so we'll see. I've got to wait because if he's too noisy, I won't be able to have him at school. I may just have to keep him here. But right now I have all nine in my garage and they will eventually, I will put keep them in that kennel because you have to acclimate them to the other chickens. So I will take that to school. Right. And they can see each other through that. And the old girls will kind of have to just get used to it. And there's some little, like, you know, peck so order. So who is taking care of the chickens who are at school right now? Me. Okay, so I do. So I go, I go, I mean, I don't go every day. They've got, they've got a huge water. And it's in the shade and it stays really cool. Okay. Um, and they have a huge feeder. So, and the, our school is near a neighborhood. So there's a lot of families that use our playground and they ride their bikes. There's a trail yeah. and everything. So. They know to go by and like throw carrots or whatever in there, yeah. you know, anything they can fit through the little hole. Okay. So I go every other day at least. Good. But um, yeah, so I'm a chicken. I'm a chicken tender. And then you said that this is part of like you sell the eggs. So tell me how oh, does yeah. that so, work in your school to, like day? We just have them at the front desk. So like I go every afternoon and out there to check. And, um, you know, we usually have six to seven eggs a day. And once we have a dozen, I put them in the front debt, the front office, and we sell them for five dollars. Wait, and then you can have is that money that goes to them. the library? <laughs> wait, wait, how, how does this work? No, I wish. Did, no, oh. it goes to it goes back into their food, like for us to continue oh. to feed them. Oh, yes. So when they aren't laying, my bookkeeper's like, the girls better start laying, or they're gonna go in the stew pot. Oh. And I have to go out there and give them like a pet talk. I'm like, girls. Miss Lane is going to put you in the stew pot. Come on, girls. Come on. So forgive so, me. So like, I'll give them. What is, I mean, you yes. said that you have some that are getting a little long in the tooth. Yeah. All right. So, so this is, this is, I mean, do the kids ask those hard questions? Because the podcaster does. Yeah. No, they do. Um, so this past year during, we call the club for the chickens is called Dirt. It's Discover. Um, God, I can't even remember now. Um. The R is the reduce, reduce, recycle. T, the T is for teach. Oh, my gosh. Oh, investigate. So discover, investigate, reduce, reduce, recycle, and teach. So we, so that's the dirt club, and they help with the chickens. And so we had one that got, they could tell, they were like, she doesn't look like she's feeling good. And she was staying in the nesting box. She wouldn't get up. If I did pick her up, she wasn't putting her legs down, like to support herself. And um, the other two that were like her had already passed, like, not too long ago. So it was just certain breeds just kind of all go together. And so the next day I went out there and so they saw her, but she, I mean, they knew she wasn't feeling good, but they didn't find her like I found her. So, but it just happens. And then. Okay. Well, uh, well tell me, does it go into the stew pot? <laughs> no, I can't do that. I don't, I've never like plucked water, done any of that. I know some people can do that. Okay. Well, I just have to ask. I just put them in a box. That I'm just, curious. Yes. yes. But uh, these aren't really, I mean. People raise meat birds, and those are meant for meat. These are more just laying, lay, uh, they're called laying hens. And we just get, see, and just for their eggs. It shows you how little I know. I, know. But girl, so I just don't you, know. Once you get into <laughs> it's so much fun. Ugh. They're so sweet. I, I'm pretty sure that the zoning for my community no, will probably, not allow no. for, no, probably not allow know. where I, mean, I live. Even in Savannah, you can have, you can't have roosters, but you can, like, there's a lot, like, even Atlanta, they've got, like these, like some of the bougier neighborhoods have like, their coops are like over the top and it's like ridiculous. But no, we just have a sweet little coop. That's and fine. But I love that. I mean, and I think you've sort of hinted about this all throughout our conversation, but there is our, there are opportunities for our students to find learning in, in oh, yeah. having these, these yeah. chickens and, just, and these chicks. Yeah. And there's always an educational component to it. I will tell you that um, our ESS, Exceptional Student Services, um, that our kids who just sometimes need some downtime, maybe that we're having a really loud um, assembly and they are very noise sensitive, they love the chickens. They love to just walk out there. One of our guidance counselors usually goes with them or one of their teachers. And, you know, if they want me to open it up, sometimes they're a little nervous, but they just just to sit and watch. I know it sounds like until you do it, but just watching the chickens. You know, it's like an emotional support chicken. Yes, it is. And 
We have a neighbor who she had way too many and she had to get hers registered for that. I know that sounds crazy and that's a whole nother tangent. But yeah, yeah, that's a whole nother. But they just enjoy like watching them scratch and just move around and just, and their little noises, like those are, yeah, they just make these sweet noises and it's just very calming. And so our kids love it. Well, and I think what's helpful to our listening audience is that this is something which, an undertaking, which, you know, it sounds like fun. It is work, but it also has, especially at the elementary school level, opportunities to introduce life cycle, to opportunities to introduce all of the issues about responsibility and taking care of, of others uh, and, and allows the students a, a place and a, note, a time in their day that they can investigate in a way that is safe and appropriate. And, you know, I, I love that. You know, tell me, you know, you have obviously found a new home for yourself, your energy. You are absolutely entrenched in the everyday uh, of your school. And I just, tell us some more about what it is that you have found really does excite you every single day because I think there are some people who, forgive me, it, 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 I mean, look at where you are in your career. There are some people for whom, and I'm not kidding because I work alongside them, is that they know to the day they've got a countdown clock. There is a countdown clock going down right now. I mean, and, and they know. I have no idea. I really, like, people, I'll sit there and try to calculate, and then I forget because I'm like, why am I even calculating? And I mean, I still have a daughter who's in 10th grade and I'm not like, I've got to, I don't know, like, I don't even think about it for the money. I mean, if I love, if you love what you're doing, it's not really work. I mean, you see that a lot. That's like a little saying you have on your desk or something, but it just, I don't know, like those kids, like I am just in my zone at school. Like I love, like summer's hard for me. Like I miss being there. Um, you know, I see the kids out at the grocery store or a restaurant and there's like, <laughs> And I'm like, hey, you want a play date? And their mom's like, yeah, come here to the house. <laughs> and my husband's like, there you go. You're acting like a five-year-old. I'm like, but I miss some. I'm like, can't they just come hang out at the house? He's like, that's a little creepy, Robin. And I'm like, okay, well, so, okay, we'll go to the park or something. But it's just like, I, I love story time. I mean, reading books and like voices and all that, like totally my jam. Like, I mean, I did it with my kids growing up. And... That was the one thing I guess I just didn't think about, like, with elementary that I would love so much. I mean, I just, you know, it's something I just enjoy doing in general. High school, you don't get to do it as much. But I did do, occasionally I would introduce, like, a picture book, like, point of view. You know, when I'm doing it with 10th grade English, and they're like, oh, we're going to read a picture book. They loved it. Or even our ESS kids, we had some severe profound kids who would, you know, just as a sensory walk, come to the library. And we would, I mean, even if it was just, like, a quick story and a coloring sheet, something to get them out of their room, you know, walk in the hall, you know, see other people. But I just, I mean, novel effects, I can't say enough about that. That changed everything. Cause like, I already feel like I do a good job telling stories, but when that music is in the background and that the kids are just, I mean, like I have teachers who'll take pictures of their kids and they're just like enraptured. And I don't think it's just because of me. I think it's novel effect. I mean, and they know they've got a great product. I mean, they're adding stories all the time. Some people just don't want to do the work of genrefication or they don't understand it, like how the benefits are. But when my kids, especially my kindergartners, we first showed them that and they're like, I just want dog books. Well, here you go. I mean, and th they don't, we no longer have to search. Like I'm, some people say they got to learn how to alphabetize. Not in kindergarten. They, they don't know who the, I don't even know who the author is half the time. I mean, like, I don't know. You just want the, like I think about Josh Funk, you know, and uh, he's got a new one coming out, the attack of the scones and, but I mean, they don't know that he's the author all the time. I mean, that's too much for their little brains in 10 minutes to check out a book. And I'm like, here are the humor books right here. You want some Josh Funk? Right here is where you're going to go. You know, I just feel like when they can independently find that book and they're like, oh, God, I found the one I want, you know, or nonfiction, like, you know, all the whales and sharks and all that. And um, that just makes me like, I'm not saying it. it some people say, well, that's just lazy because you, you, you don't want to have to help them find one. No, it's called independence. And it's like, that's when they discover something that on their own, 
it, it's that self reward. I mean, there's like, yes, I mean, that it, they're so pumped without me just handing something off the shelf to them. It's that that ownership that they take of the space. Yes. Elementary students love to be able to demonstrate their expertise to their peers. Oh, Mr. Herman, I'll, I'll go show them where that book is. Mr. Herman, I'll go show them where, oh, I know where that book is, come with me. You know, and you've got so many students who want to be that, that, that source of, of support and it validates them and how capable they are. And I, I know that you respond in kind. Yeah. We live in a transient community. Yeah. We, we have such a big military community. And so we have new students. Like at Christmas, we lost 36, but we gained 54. That's a lot of new kids. And we have the Hyundai plant, a meta plant being built. So we have a huge um, Korean population coming. Um, and the kids, whenever a new student comes, there's always one of them. I'll say, let me show you red light. No, 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 let me show them. They love it. And so it makes me start thinking like, can I start doing library ambassadors? You know, are there some fifth graders, fourth graders that could, hand, you know, just at least when we do have new students, hey, if they're not one of the class, they could come and say, let me show you around the library because Ms. Thompson's over there doing this or whatever. And so I just, I want them to have ownership in that library. I want them to feel like I do. And I ask them like, are there, is there a section we're missing? What needs some beef? You know, is there something new coming? I don't always know everything. You know, if I don't read a, Wings of Fire graphic novel, they're going to tell me before I know sometimes that that's coming out. And why don't you have it? Well, because I'm not Amazon. And it just because it came out yesterday doesn't mean I'm going to have it today. I just want them to feel invested in it and that it's just integral to our school, that they we just have to have it. And I feel like in, if that's all in place, then I've got job security. And I'm not doing it for that. But I mean, in a way I am, because I do worry in our climate that, I mean, if, if it doesn't look important, we are going to be in, you know, gotten rid of. And so um, anyway, I got so many great ideas from the sessions that were offered at Summer Institute just a couple weeks ago. Uh, you know, and, and I think the wonderful thing is we have all summer, you and I, uh -huh. to sort of think about those things oh, yeah. and consider how we want to implement those ideas in our own spaces. You know, and I think about, you know, you're an instigator. You're always looking for something that's going to just, you know, Make sure that that people, you, you're not going to fade quietly into the woodwork. You are absolutely going to be noticed. So let me ask you, you know, are you, is there something that you're looking at carefully and you're wondering, maybe this is something that I want to start in my program? And yeah, I mean, the, the more I've learned, like there was a couple of sessions about library ambassadors and a lot of it was more middle and high school. At, so at GLMA Summer Institute, we had a couple of them that said like, um, I, I, most of them called it library or uh, library friends. I, most of them, I think, was ambassadors. And my elementary probably wouldn't know what that means. It'd be probably more like library helpers or something. I really just feel like there is that potential, just having seen some of that happen this past year. And so trying to think through, because I also don't want them to miss a ton of class and that kind of thing. So working out where, because one of the things that some of the fourth and fifth grade teachers especially say, the reason they don't come is we just don't have time. And so um, if they don't have time to come, they're sure not going to let their, you know, one of their students who maybe wants to be a helper come. So just trying to figure that out and making sure that it's not a burden on that teacher to let their kids come. We have the beginnings. We have a lot of makerspace stuff, but we just have not got it full. And I know it's just that get it out there, put it out there, let them go to it and let them play. But the, there still has to be some organization. And that's one of those, like, I mean, I read tons on makerspaces. And we started definitely going that way this year or this past year with some some ideas. But I need to be more forward with getting that out there for my kids. Well, we'll make sure that we include uh, friends in the in the uh, show notes, the playlist. There is a makerspace playlist <laughs> because there is. And, and you know, I, I think when it comes to to getting our, our littles, because I, I worked in an elementary school setting for seven years without an assistant. And uh, I'll tell you what. They loved scan books. And I had kids fighting over the scanners to do inventory. I had kids fighting over the scanners to check books in in the morning. Uh, I had students uh, fighting over who got to run checkouts. There's something about power. There's like the power of that. It's almost like. And, you know, I, honestly, I, I had two kids per, per class who would run checkout. And I could hear the beeps. We had the good beeps, the bad beeps, you know. And, uh, oh, yeah. you know, that was something that was a nice start. And so, no, I, I think that it's not hard. You just have to recognize there's that initial like training, but 
I mean, for me, I had library assistants in elementary because these were families who did not, had to drop their kids off early and we didn't have a before school oh, yeah. care yeah. that it cost money. So they, yeah. they came and sat in the library because they were being dropped off way too early. And I was like, Oh, way no, before. you can just yeah. come in. How about you help me? <laughs> yeah. So you have didn't that. have that, but yeah. That, yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, like if they sit still there, I mean, they're going to get in trouble. Like, right. so give them something yes. to do. So Keep no, no, no. I think that's fantastic. Robin, I am so grateful you and I had a chance to connect. I know we are working on, on a follow-up episode because I love sitting in your session and that is a, it, it, that's a team effort and we will make sure that, that to have you on. Uh, yes. Probably uh, starting in uh, our next season very soon. So thank you so much. Uh, yeah. You know, have a fantastic right. summer. Please make sure, would you let listeners know how we can find you? Because I was absolutely enthralled watching the uh, posts that you shared on social media. Please let listeners know how we can find you and watch some of your antics because you are absolutely a, an important reminder of how to find joy in everything. Oh, Thanks. Um, Instagram um, and Twitter, now X, um, is at Crazy Mrs. T. So C R A Z Y M R S T. And then on TikTok, it's at I, underscore Crazy Mrs. T. But if you put in Crazy Mrs. T, you'll probably find it. And um, Facebook, you know, just my regular name. But really, most of my stuff is going to be on Instagram, X, and um, TikTok. Fantastic. Have a terrific summer. Thanks. Thank you so much for sharing your joy. Thank you for having me. I was so excited. Take care, Robin, and have a great summer. Thank you. Friends, if you found this episode helpful, please share it out with your team, your PLN, and on social media. Be sure to follow on your favorite podcatcher so you'll never miss an episode. And if you really like listening today, consider leaving a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Reviews help others find us. Use the code UNITED to take advantage of Capstone's generous $20 discount off an order of $100 or more. See the link in today's show notes. And friends, if you're tuning in on June 28th, the day this episode goes live, I am in San Diego for the start of American Library Association's annual conference. If you're also attending, I hope we cross paths. Message me on X at SLU underscore United. I'll be handing out podcast swag and collecting recordings of attendees for next week's episode. And because I am in full podcast mode, recording all summer long, we will most definitely have an episode next week, Friday, July 5th. The topic will be American Library Association's annual conference and my conversation with the attendees this week. I hope you will tune in.